Truck stuff under the Fair Housing Act. We're here to no, learn. I haven't even delved into that. You know, I haven't even delved in that. No. Most of the uh, accommodations we request are more for like policy issues, like wanting to ask for an accommodation as far as like extensions on vouchers and whatnot. And getting, I haven't had any for the uh, request for emotional support. Animals. You haven't had emotional support animals? I get no. twice a week. I get, two, a week. I get two cases a week for people calling me about ESA. We used, for a while, we had like a string of cases coming in where it's like older woman, mm -hmm. like a lot of people had them. We were trying to get uh, the ESA requested for all of them. Obviously, it's, it didn't it's happen, but difficult with that. Okay, now would it be better if I stood here? But what I have to face you. Happen. Are you recording this too? I will be once we yeah. figure out where Matt has to stand. Oh, okay. Well, what I could do is I can move this table. We have our other SCDL partners, and then I, I could be right here. Is this how's this? And it wasn't like a. So, so let me give you an example of something that I. Char and Jordan, I'm tired of looking at them. <laughs> yes, Terry. That is definitely Terry. Okay, so, so, so I am standing here. So, so, so here's good. <laughs> or maybe I should like go back a little bit more. Okay. Am I like Thanks, too far Terry. Away? Yeah, you have to be too far because there's a little camera up at the front. I think at the yeah, top. Yeah, but I'm very big. big. <laughs> I would, everybody wishes they were Shaq's eye, but I don't think. Really. Okay. So I got a call today. Um, I'm waiting for the answer. A student at X University of Miami who lives in a dorm who had cerebral palsy. And he lives in an old dorm and he asked for things to be fixed. And the question is which law applies? If, it, if it's an old dorm, how is it in, in a university? What is it ADA? Is it fair housing? Is it Section 504? Is it new construction? Is it old construction? I mean, with dorms, you have every single wall there. Yeah. It's, it's fair housing because it's housing, right? A person lives there as, as a resident, so everything involving college housing is, is, is fair housing. Is it ADA? Yeah, it's Amen. university. So it's ADA. Yes, it's Section 504. They accept federal financial assistance. So, so the question is, now with regards to the ADA, should they put him, if an old dorm is inaccessible, what do they have to do? They have to put him in a new dorm that's fully accessible, or they have to put him in, um, or they have to tear up the old dorm room to make it accessible to Section 504. With Section 504, you can get anything done. It's the requirement to, to, um, to make sure it's done. So, so it was interesting when you're speaking to this, to this new intake, um, this new client, what law applies? What part of the premises applies? If it's outside, if it's the common areas of a, of a housing development, what applies? Is it the ADA? Is it the Fair Housing Act? Fair Housing Act applies to common elements for a new premises. So, and the difference is for, for claimants is under the Fair Housing Act, there's damages. Um, under the Rehabilitation Act, under Section 504, there are damages. But the damages are limited to what you could prove was intentional. Under the Fair Housing Act, you get damages without a demonstration of intent. You could get punitive damages um, as long as it's not a governmental entity, but you can get it without a demonstration of intent. You could get compensatory damages. So, so when you're dealing with one of these places, you think of what law applies, when does it apply, and now we're going to talk about 
design and construction. Design and construction, I actually had the first design and construct jury trial um, against Emory University. Oh, ever? I thought you were going to say like in Florida or something like that. Ever. No, Emory University. So I, I drove all the way up to Atlanta and I did it. It was so incredibly boring because you can't really have a two-week trial on, on thresholds and doorways and kitchen things. So it was, we won my belief damages were nominal. So it, it was a very difficult case, but when you're dealing with design and construct, any entity who is involved in the design or construction of the premises is going to be liable. Let's go to the next slide. So the first issue is, is what is covered by the the Fair Housing Act design and construct standards. Now, what is covered is, first of all, the housing has to be, has to be multifamily housing. That's the four or more units. Next. If it's an elevator building, it has to be, all the units have to be accessible. In the buildings without an elevator, the ground floor units. And the date of this, and this is the important thing, and we're going to talk about statute of limitations later, it has to be constructed for first occupancy after March 13, 1991. So, I'm just going to ask, so in a building without out an elevator, somebody who lives on the second floor would not be able to bring a, a design and construction claim under the Fair Housing Act? Or? For, for their units on the second or, or higher floor that's not on an accessible path. So, if there is an elevator, then everything would have to be on accessible. Hmm. But all of the ground floor units would have to be accessible for sort of the Fair Housing Act standards. Hmm. Okay. What is not covered? Single family houses. <clears throat> duplexes or triplexes, or multi-story townhouses. Now, if you have a row of townhouses that are all linked up together, those would be four or more units in one structure. So it essentially has to be a townhouse that's detached, that's a freestanding townhouse. So any buildings, no matter how they're connected with each other, if there are four more units, it's going to be covered. Next. Now, the important thing is what is for occupancy. I have a question. Yes. Going back to that. So, for what's the part that where it's not covered? So, a detached single family house is not. So, you're saying if it's multi story townhomes and they're all attached to one another, what is like they're, they all have separate homes? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. No, it's like it's like a condominium. I mean, condominiums is a building that's all attached, and they're all different owners of the condo. If it's more than four units, it, it would be covered. Okay. What is first occupancy? First occupancy is is an interesting concept when it comes to the Fair Housing Act. Um, it's defined the regulations. A building that has never been that had never before been used for any purpose. So it, it's a conversion from a commercial loft space or a commercial business into a multifamily dwelling if it was from 1930 and they tore up the whole inside of it and rebuilt it. In the inside, it would not be new construction. It would not have to follow the Fair Housing Act sta standards. Next. So any alterations, rehabilitations, or repairs of pre-existing residential buildings are not covered. On the other hand, next one. No, no, no. Go back. Oh, that, that was all one slide? I thought they were like all the one things. Okay, good. It's all together. <laughs> <laughs> so if if it's an addition, let's say let's say you have an old building and you're building a new wing on an old building, an addition on an on an older building, that addition will be covered. So all the units in that addition will be covered. If you just use the facade 
of an old building, but built a whole new building in back of just a facade, that would be covered by, by the Fair Housing Act. So it's just a rehabilitation of an older building, no matter how much the rehabilitation is, would not be covered under the new construction debt. Now, the design and construction standards have, have seven issues, and we're going to talk about each issue, and then we're going to talk about the common problems that you see and what to watch for. Can you imagine doing a whole trial like this? I mean, you've got to stay up, and, it, and it's just in five minutes. <laughs> now, these, are, these are really important issues. The whole purpose of the, 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 the Fair Housing Act design and construction standards was to make um, housing usable for persons with disabilities and easily adaptable for persons with disabilities. So, so they came up with these with these seven standards: accessible building entrance on an accessible route, um, accessible and usable public and common use areas, usable doors, accessible routes into and through the covered unit, light switches, electrical outlets, thermostats, and other environmental controls in accessible locations, reinforced walls and bathrooms for later installation of grab bars, and usable kitchens and bathrooms. There's a huge difference between the Fair Housing Act and the ADA. Um, the Fair Housing Act promotes an adaptable apartment. So you can take the apartment, put in some grab bars, and put in whatever other materials you need in order to live there if you're a person with a disability. It has the basic bones of accessibility, but it is not accessible. One big difference is, um, and, and we'll see in usable bathrooms, an accessible bathroom under the ADA has enough room so a person could have a six-foot turnaround radius inside the bathroom. An, accept, an adaptable bathroom under the Fair Housing Act has a sufficient to, um, entrance sufficient space to get in the door, to close the door at a 30 by 48 inch box in front of the shower, toilet, and sink. So it doesn't give you all of the room you need. And one thing that you probably see often is in kitchens, and we're going to talk about kitchens, and we'll talk about the difference between the ADA and the Fair Housing Act and the difference between accessibility and adaptability once we do each thing. The first issue, accessible building on an accessible route. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt. I know you said this at the beginning, but I think I missed it. Who did you say would be liable under all these different um, schemes for these design and construction uh, uh, violations? Anybody who was substantially involved in the design or the construction of the premises. Architects, contractors, subcontractors, owners, owners. GC. Hmm. And you said accessible is ADA? No. No. I'm accessible is not ADA. This is Fair Housing Act. It's adaptable. And we're going to go into the each Fair Housing Act is, is adaptable. It's not, it's not accessible. It's the bare bones. It's the basic minimum. Now, again, we're talking about the AD, we're talking about the Fair Housing Act. Florida Code provides for accessibility on some occasions. Than, than you would see under the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act is, is the baseline. A lot of folks don't design as the Fair Housing Act because they don't think it is as aesthetically pleasing as they want. You have to have your thermostats at a certain height, your outlets at a certain height, your doors a certain width, um, your sinks a certain distance from, from the uh, sidewall so there's all of these little tiny things but those little tiny things mean a lot and I'll go into them a little bit accessible route means a continuous unobstructed path connecting accessible elements within a um, within a building or site that could be negotiated by a person with a disability connecting accessible entrance to the building entrance connected by an accessible route on public transit stop accessible parking and tied to the loading zones or public sidewalk. How does the person get from their car to the apartment? How does the person get from public transportation to their apartment? 
Is there an accessible route that they can go to with an accessible door? Is there an accessible route? Um, and this is the most important thing. If you can't get from your car to your apartment, you have an issue. You have a problem. <laughs> Next. Accessible and usable public and common use areas. These are all parts of the housing outside the individual units. So it is every single area that everybody is getting um, a chance to go into. Now, this is very similar to the ADA, the, the, the public use areas. The Fair Housing Act was, um, was enacted before the ADA. It was enacted in 1988. So it did not adopt the ADA standards. It adopted standards called ANSI 117.1. And there's seven, and also there's other seven safe harbors that that the Fair Housing Act adopts. So, but for purposes of you guys, and you're being able to, to use this, think of the ADA standards, because they're the easiest to find. Um, and many of them are, are similar. So your exterior places should all be fully accessible. You should have sidewalks that are accessible, and we'll talk about some of the issues later. Sidewalks, parking spaces, um, bathrooms. In public areas in a new building, your bathroom should be fully ADA accessible. You should have an a accessible stall. You should have accessible, instead of having doorknobs, they should be levers. So everything in the public and common use areas must be fully accessible. I had a case in which the entire case, all we did was we measured sidewalks and the slope of the sidewalk to make sure that the sidewalks were accessible in the new development. Next. And we'll go into the common issues and I'll talk about sidewalks. Usable doors, extraordinarily important. The third requirement, all doors must allow passage into and within all premises must be wide enough to allow passage by persons using wheelchairs. What is wide enough for a door? 32 inches, open space. So if you open it 90 degree angle, 32 inches. Those are usable doors. Um, also, the, also, they can't have a threshold higher than a half an inch bevel, um, one to two. So it's a, you have to have a very small threshold. Threshold has to be beveled. Next. Accessible routes into and through the covered unit. Accessible route is, um, is 36 inches. And there has to be enough room for a turnaround area inside the, the room. Light switches, electrical outlets, thermostats, <clears throat> and other environmental controls must be in accessible locations. Need to be high enough so a person in a wheelchair could reach it, and low enough that a person in a wheelchair out of their wheelchair. So what you usually have for a side approach, you have 54 inches, and for a the the high the lowest it could be is 15 inches off the finished floor. Next, same with thermostats too. You see, often people with thermostats like way up that you can't reach it, can't do it. Reinforced walls and passages. <coughs> of grab bars. The law does not require grab bars in a new apartment. It requires a reinforced wall so a person could screw in a grab bar and the grab bar and lean on the grab bar so it doesn't fall off. All new places should have reinforced walls. It's hard to determine when looking at a place um, if a person installs a grab bar and it comes out, that's one way to figure it out. Um, the, uh, the other way is if you can go through it or see the plan, it should show reinforced walls. Next. Seven, the last one, 
is usable kitchens and bathrooms. Usable kitchens and bathrooms be a lot. Basically, so a person in a wheelchair can maneuver in the space provided. And there's only a few rules with regards to that. There has to be a clear space in front of um, the appliances. And there has to be 40 inches from counter to counter. Sometimes, um, we'll go over some common problems in a little bit, is your refrigerator's huge. And it cuts down from the 40 inches to 38 inches or 36 inches because of the size of the refrigerator too big. That's when the owner of the apartment and the designer really aren't in sync. The important measurements when you're looking at what's usable, either in kitchens or bathrooms, is a 30 by 48 inch box. And if there's only one thing you remember in measuring things today, it's that 30 by 48 inch box. If that box is um, by an appliance, a dishwasher, or a sink, and you have that entire box there, and it's centered on that box, then it, it, it would make an appliance or sink or toilet usable. Which law applies? Now, remember what I was telling you about the Fair Housing Act is, is the floor. It's always the floor in whatever you do and whatever property you see but they also must follow state and local buildings, which may be more than, is, than the Fair Housing Act. So um, the, the one that provides the most accessibility will prevail. And some stat statutes also have, have damage provisions with regard to violations of, let's say the Florida Fair Housing Act is a cause of action for failure to comply with that if an injury is due to that. And that's, under 553. I actually spoke about last time. Next slide. We spoke about these last time, the other parameters of the Fair Housing Act. And there's refusing to provide reasonable accommodations, refusing to allow um, structural modifications, people <clears throat> differently, disparate treatment, or, or retaliation. Now, Modifications, reasonable modifications and design construction go pretty much go hand in hand. And the reason why is if it's not accessible or if it's too if it's, if it's too old, if, if it predates 1991, then in order to get structural accessibility, you have to ask for a reasonable modification. In order to put up grab bars in a rental unit. But you have to ask for a reasonable um, modification, whether it predates or postdates 1991. So a reasonable modification goes hand in hand with it. You don't have to ask for reasonable modifications for things that should originally be built and tested. Except if you do, there are two causes of action. The most novel thing that we're dealing with now in um, Fair Housing Act Design and Construct is the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations under the Fair Housing Act is two years from the date of occurrence or the termination of an alleged housing practice. So the Ninth Circuit, which is the highest court that's spoken on this so has said the two years, um, the two years um, starts at the date of the last certificate of, of occupancy. So if you have a building that was built in 1991, it was fully occupied by 1992, your statute of limitations expires in 1994. So it's very <laughs> difficult to break a case against even in the 90s or in the, in the 2000s because you have that two years. Now, HUD has a different interpretation of that. HUD, does, HUD says that the statute commences when somebody is affected by a barrier. Now, 
nobody has done an appeal of a HUD ALJ action to the secretary to determine whether or not they're going to go by what the Ninth Circuit said or whether they're going to go by the HUD interpretation of it. In the Eleventh Circuit, I would not chance it. If the Ninth Circuit has restricted enough interpretation of it, you will not expect anything less from anywhere else. Now, the exception to that, and this is huge, if it's a continuous policy or practice with regards to a non-compliant design and construction, it's if their latest development, or if they're still building as to that same design and construction, where is that relevant? It's every single affordable housing provider. Have you been to those places? They're all the same. It doesn't matter whether they were built in the 90s or whether they were built last year. So if I live in the one that was built in 1990, or where the statute says running in 1994, or it expired, and you can show that they built the same builder built a construction just last year, is that what you're saying? Got okay. it. Gotcha. And that's, I had a case against, against Cornerstone. We went back all the way to the 1990s because they're still building. Wait, is it premised on the identity of the builder or the use of like the design, the defective like construction design? It's the same thing. It's the other. If it's the same builder that builds the same in the same way, it's still the same construction. It's still you. You may have different persons to sue. For example, let's say it was the same architect that they've used, or a lot of these affordable housing providers do their own building. Or, or even have their own architects. I mean, that's how they save money in, in building their developments, affordable housing developments, and that's how they get the funding and they save money on each step of the, of the um, low income tax credit affordable housing and the grants by, by having the same builders, by using the same programs, by doing all these things similarly. So, so what you need to do, let's say, you had a, a building from 1995, and it was, I don't know, Pinnacle or, or Carlisle, which I don't think is going to build anything <laughs> anytime soon. But, but, but let's say for argument say Carlisle, okay? And you go to something that was built in 1995, you would then immediately see what other buildings they built, what other, what other developments they have, check the newest ones to see whether or not they still build that way. So you would have to do, if you were doing testing, you would do testing through a whole bunch of their constructions. Mm -hmm. so, so you can't look at the development itself, you have to look at the architect and the, and the builder to determine whether or not you have a case. Okay, so, okay, so I'm that like, how, to what extent do you need to focus on the actual design of the individual building? It sounds like you can't just say, oh, it's Carlo now, same thing, you have to, actually look at the yeah no, you would have to look at it because yeah. if they learn and they stop building it in a, in a defective in violation way you can't get them anymore yeah mm -hmm. um you you may be able to get them on section 504 or under another thing for if they do receive a subsidy but you wouldn't be able to get them under under fair housing act design and construct because of the two-year issue Common design and construction of violation. This is where we have our good pictures. Now, you have to remember that accessibility when, when you do inspection, it, it's measured in inches. And all the inches mean a lot, even a half an inch. Um, it requires attention to detail. It requires conscientious application of design so um, the the inches make a difference between compliance and non-compliance, especially when it comes to things that are measured in inches and half inches, like thresholds or doorways. Common violation. <laughs> I got these from Fair Housing um, Accessibility First. I love their designs. 
um, Kansas has steps to, has steps to receive rent. Now, this is a necessary tool. This is a smart level. Guy Fingers, every expert has it. It's something that it's something that he needs. It basically says what the slope is, oh. and it does it in a way that um, you could you could measure even a slight variation in slope because when you're looking at the common violations of what's your 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 slope, you have to look at both the um, direct slope, the running slope, and the cross slope because if the running slope is too steep. You're, you this what ha this is what happens. It's a skateboard ramp. If the cross slope is too steep, then what happens is you flip over or you go into the street. So and this is part of designing for um and for entry doors and for common areas. Now if you have a so you really have to watch that it really is no higher than 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 two inch than two inch, than two percent for um for a running slope or else it may be too steep. Now if it's over um five percent, which is one in twelve, then that's then that is then that is too steep. It's it's too steep to be a ramp. I mean if it's under, um, if it's between, gosh, I'm going to get all these messed up. But they're all in there. If it's if it if it is less, if it is um, between two percent and one in twelve, then you have to have handrails. But again, there's a whole issue of having a flat surface by the entry door. So you really have to watch out that your entry is usable by a person who is in a wheelchair. If you have your entry on a slope, a person will not be able to get into the door because you will not be able to open the door and get through the door if you're on a slope. See, what do you think? What I can go back. The, the kid is like poking his mom. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, staff set an entrance. No, shouldn't have it. That should be. It, it happens though. I mean, you see it all the time. Unless for some reason it's due to terrain or unusual circumstances, and in Florida you don't have terrain. Don't unless you're in the Everglades and you need to get to your place by a um, <laughs> airboat. <laughs> What's the uh, unusual site characteristic that you think that would allow for this person to be Um, mountains. <laughs> Cliffs. What about flooding? Flooding, flooding would do it, but of course you could build things so you're, you, um, you wouldn't have the effects of it. Also a beach. I mean, can you build a sidewalk? If there's a sidewalk there, I mean there there's very few site there are very few site categories <clears throat> that you would see in South Florida that you would really have an issue with regards to um, having an entry into a, a premises. You you see them more on places that are more mountainous. That that you may have an issue with with having a slope and here. Um, these are the issues that I was talking about. Slopes that do not exceed. Now, um, some of the key feet, um, steep entrance walls, slopes that do not exceed one in 20, one inch uh, rise for every 20 inches of runner length, that's uh, a 2% slopes. Or if slopes exceed one to 20, walks must be designated as ramps. If there's a ramp, they need to have grab bars if they're over six feet. Um, ramps must have railings on both sides have edge protections and appropriate size branding at the top and bottoms of the ramps. And ramps must not have slopes that are steeper than 1 in 12. That's why it's so important to have this. 
because it really does work. And also, it makes you look like you're like an ADA lawyer. <laughs> so only ADA lawyers do have them, and and ADA experts. <laughs> yeah, but 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 it, the reason why the reason why this is good and not and not the app is this does it over a longer area. Oh, okay. so so um, because it's so long, instead of getting the one inch the that you're doing, you 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 have two feet, which gives you a better um, way to measure the ramp. It's like you break that out and they're like, we'll settle. We just exactly. <laughs> it's just, I've done it before. <laughs> Next common violation. There's no connection between the building entrances and pedestrian arrival areas. It's where they Sorry. put the parking spots. I mean, a lot of these things you see and you're like, what idiot thought of this? I mean, if you look at the next one, the next picture. And this is when, when these things get a little exciting and, and not as bright as you actually get, get to see it. Why did they have the access aisle running to the curb? <laughs> How often do you see that? Is that a ramp next to it? No, it's just a curb. There's a curb here curb. and then a curb there. What's the purpose of having the access aisle if there's a curb on it? Right. So, so you look at this, you see they have the spot. You see they've lined it up. You put this on the wheelchair, and there's an there's it runs right into the curb. I mean, you look at that, and you're like, really? Come on, dude. You know this is bad. Okay. When entrance walks are required be accessible under requirement one. They must be accessible at least in the dwelling entrance to the pedestrian arrival area. There must not be any steps and curb ramps must be used. There's a certain design for a curb ramp. It's not the piece of asphalt that goes up that's that's a dangerous piece of asphalt. It it's a, it is a ramp that somebody's not gonna get hurt on that has the appropriate Slope and those um, dimensions are either in ANSI 117.1 or, or in the guidelines. <clears throat> Next. Rapid accessibility solutions provide entrance walks with slopes not greater than 120, provide accessible wrap to pedestrian arrival points. Now, there's an issue with. Well, in, in the access, in the, in the accessible route, it does not have to be the most accessible route. That's something to remember. Um, it could be a more circuitous route, but there only has to be one accessible route. Not every route needs to be accessible. So in that uh, left access curve example we just saw, if they had like a um, curb, uh, sure the, the right word basically like the, the ramp from the sidewalk to the curb further down and then you could uh, just go to the parking lot would that be the accessible no no an access aisle is supposed to be access up not only to the to the right of the car so it's supposed to be access to the side directly to the curb mm -hmm. so so it, it, it's the failure of the access aisle we're actually see that because whereas the, the whole purpose of an access aisle is not to have a person who uses a wheelchair go in traffic. Yeah. So by not having any access from the access side, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's called an access. Mm -hmm. Next. Accessible. Can can you believe? I mean, what was the guy like smoking when he was going on these pictures? <laughs> <laughs> Accessible and usable public and common use area. Curb ramps are too steep have flared edges or are only accessed from heavy traffic areas. Now, um, curb ramps are important. I think that people, usually, people sometimes just pour asphalt and make a curb ramp. They have specific dimensions which are important because they're there so this doesn't, the person doesn't, doesn't have to go in the, in the street. Next. 
and this is why. If ramps are too steep, they can be dangerous or unstable. If they consist of a pile of asphalt, they make lack sufficient width, which may cause people using them to fall off the sides or traffic accidents. And also, the piles of asphalt are dangerous to all residents. The other things that we see in accessible uh, on common use areas that are that are common issues or problems and not in the um, not in this PowerPoint. For example, pools. If there is a pool, the question is: If there is a pool gate, how is someone going to open up the pool gate? Are the controls in a in a way that a person with a disability can can use the controls? If there's a shower, can the person with a disability use the shower? Can is is the shower control something that they could pull down? Or is there a path to all of the accessible areas? <clears throat> a usable path with the correct slope? Are the bathrooms and the public areas accessible for a person in a, in a wheelchair, meaning fully accessible? Is the clubhouse accessible? for a person in a wheelchair? Are the amenities in the clubhouse accessible for a person in a wheelchair? How does somebody turn in their rent? What office do they go in to use? All of these things have to be fully accessible if it is new construction. So if there's parking by the clubhouse, if the clubhouse is used and there's, and there's parking by the clubhouse, it has to be accessible. So you have to look at all of the building elements from the laundry room to the clubhouse and a lot of affordable housing premises require um, um, require computer rooms. The computer rooms you have to have a desk couch that is that is accessible for a person in a wheelchair to go under. So you have to think about all of these different areas, not only in the person's apartment. But, but throughout the entire development. And a lot of folks don't look at pools. One of the issues that we had with pools is that the slopes on the pool deck exceeded 2%. If they exceed 2%, then they're done wrong and the entire pool is incorrect because it's a hazard to a person that may roll into the pool. And that, is, and that is a huge and very expensive problem for a developer when they do that. So if they have any amenities, the amenities have to be accessible. Other examples, picnic tables. You have to have an accessible picnic table. An accessible picnic table are like the ones you see that have the benches and then they have a, a space next to the benches and the, and the table extends out without having the bench underneath. The cooking areas, if there's a public barbecue, public barbecue has to be accessible with, with uh, an accessible path to it. A lot of places that have public barbecues and housing developments just stick them in the <laughs> middle of a grassy area. You have to have an accessible path to that. Garbage areas. You have to think about all of these things that a person normally goes to. Is there access to the garbage? area. If it's outside, is there a path of travel to the garbage area that they have to put their garbage in the dumpster? Can they put their garbage in the dumpster? Um, these are all issues that you need to think about when, when you go to a place, and it's like going to a place when, when you're looking for violations of the ADA, it's the same type of analysis that you look at is, is that facility accessible? Are the lamps are the lamps 80 inches high, or or, or higher? Or is someone going to hit their head when they when they walk by them? So these are all of the issues you look to when you ask: Is are the common areas accessible? When um, I spoke to the gentleman today at the university, I said, "Okay, your room isn't accessible. Is there any meeting rooms? Are there any common rooms?" How about the exterior bathroom? How do you get in and out? How do you get to your parking? How do you get to your transportation? Now, all of these things, is there a dog walking area? Is the dog walking area accessible? 
all of these things you have to think about when you're looking at the common areas. The most common one that you'll see is they don't pour the sidewalks correctly in developments. So they're too steep. There are cracks in sidewalks, the sidewalks are buckling. There's other ways in which they really didn't think about how to pour the sidewalks, and that usually is the most common one. There also has to be a minimum of 2% accessible parking in new, in new developments. Next. Usable doors, common violation. Second door to a bathroom is not wide enough. All the bathroom doors have to be 32 inches. All doors have to be 32 inches into, into a, a premises. Now, there's a difference between a usable front door and an accessible interior door. Um, a usable front door, you also have to have the last side clear space so a person could get in and out. Um, there's no requirement for a latch side clear space and a usable door inside a unit. You're only supposed to have 32 inches clear space. Next. Um, both doors must provide a 32 inch opening. Ways to do it is to, what you do is you switch the latch on the door. So instead of opening in, it opens it out. That sometimes in increases the space on the door or you use a pocket door. Pocket doors usually increase the space because the, um, the frame of the door takes up additional room. Next. Accessible route in and throughout the unit. Okay, next. Level changes at primary entrances are too high. Threshold. In a case that I had, in a case that I tried, every single threshold into a dorm room was was too high. It was not a half an inch beveled um, beveled on both sides. So every single doorway itself was a violation of the Fair Housing Act because the threshold was too high. And of course, steps. Primary door. Um, an entrance landing to a ground floor dwelling must be no more than a half an inch below the finished floor of the unit if the landing is made of impervious material like concrete. So, and if it's pervious material, the, the landing must be flush with the finished floor. This is for, um, um, this is the exterior door. You really have to have it level so a person can come in and out. Next. Carpets, don't do it. It has to be, it has to be stable. Um, what you basically do is you, is you bevel it. Um, um, you bevel the threshold if you have the necessary height. Switches, environmental outputs, and other controls are placed too high or too low. Again, this is what happens if they're too low. <laughs> One of the things that you have to you have to um, one of the things that you have to watch out is obstructions. For example, let's say you have a countertop. If you have a countertop between between a person in a wheelchair and an outlet or an environmental control, their their reach will be limited by that countertop. So Output switches and thermostats not located at a countertop should be no higher than 48 inches above the finished floor. And the next <coughs> slide, um, without without any space, let's see if it has the dimensions there. Oh, and the next one is. The dimensions. Outlets and switches are located over obstructions that are 20 to 25 inches deep. They must be no higher than 44 inches above the finish floor. What is the remedy? What happens if they do this? What do you think happens if they don't do one of these things correctly? Like put a thermostat higher than 48 inches, put an outlet um, 
higher than 44 inches or lower than 15 inches, what do you think they have to do? Fix it? Yeah. They have to fix it and they're liable for damages, but the fix is always a lot more expensive because if they did it to one unit, they, they did it to all units. Uh, so if you bring one of these claims, and so like if the plaintiff is somebody who's in a wheelchair, right? Mm -hmm. Part of the request for, for damages is fix every single unit in the that's covered? Okay. Yes. Wow. You can't just fix that, that instant unit. It's got to be the yeah, entire. It's, in, it's, it's a violation. They have to fix, fix what's wrong with, mm -hmm. the, with the premises. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if you represent a fair housing organization, it's a lot easier to expand the standing and mm -hmm. saying you really need to fix every single thing involved. So if you do find a common design, it's usually the design, it's not only the design in one unit, it's the design in 400 units. It's not the threshold in one unit, it's the threshold in 400 units. Sometimes in these things, when you're dealing with with the height of uh, an electrical outlet, you may be dealing with one subcontractor who did the same thing over and over and over again. When you're dealing with the folks that, that pour the sidewalks, you're dealing with one subcontractor who did the same thing over and over again, or, or a landscape architect. But who did it according to the design that the architect gave, is that right? Not always. Sometimes the architect says, install install light switch pursuant to FHA standards mm -hmm. without putting, it must be installed in at, at, at no higher than 44 inches. Mm -hmm. So it's just gonna have a basic statement on it. So when, when you have that, you really have a, a pattern of it happening for every time that sub, for every time um, somebody did it in that in that certain way. A lot of these times, it's not the you you see most of the issues with architects when it comes to an appropriate size hallway, when it comes to the size of a kitchen when it comes to um, the design of the accessible path. Um, when it's not something that is um, detailed, then it's usually the builder, but it's the builder's responsibility to make sure that it's done. Like an accessible path, like a threshold, to make sure that the thresholds, are fine, thresholds aren't fine to do a threshold fix to make sure the thermostats are, are not too high. But a lot of times they don't see it. And a lot of times code inspectors don't even inspect for it. Like I've been in places where every single thermostat is at 50 inches high. What do you do if it's a hallway? That's not an easy fix. Like how do they fix that? If the hallways are too narrow. Um, usually hallways too narrow really doesn't happen. But what would happen is they'd have to move the walls. So it's, these are all, all of these things when you're talking about a design and construction case, they're always the, the big issue on this, <clears throat> the injunctive relief because it costs so much. And that's why you really need to sue everybody in one of these cases. Because if you, you really want to get the, the sub and the contractor and the developer, the whole line of people that are responsible for this, for responsible for putting it back the way it should. Next, think about our, our so we represent both like people who would live in these units as legal services, but also like we have a small business unit, right? So subcontractors, right? So one of these suits might not bankrupt, you know, a, a GC, a huge company, but it absolutely would if they were sued for like subcontractors. I'm trying to figure out like what recourse would you have as a sub if you were given like build it this way and you did it exactly like that and it was an FHA violation. Um. The same thing that if you had a, a landlord tell a realtor, I don't want to, mm -hmm. I don't want to have black people in my unit, mm -hmm. and the realtor goes, okay, mm -hmm. let's not have black people for our unit. Yeah, it's the same type of agent, mm -hmm. agent liability. Mm -hmm. Reinforced walls and bathroom, reinforcing walls during construction so grab <clears throat> bars may be installed later. Next. This is what I was telling you about before. Um, 
Grab bars are put in in a, in a defined area, so they're always in 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 a, in a certain place. So builders really know how to where to place reinforcement for walls. Next, and it's both behind the bathtub and and behind the toilet. Next, <clears throat> I will open bath holes. Next. So this is this is how they do it during construction. They they just reinforce they enforce reinstalling um, behind it on the on the um, joists studs on the studs, um, or they have factory reinforced tub and shower units that that they use that you could install them on in any event. If it is senior housing, I always recommend the builders. To pre-install the grab bars, might as well. Next, usable kitchens and bathrooms. This is this is where I see the most problems because here you're dealing not only with the architect who has to design a bathroom or a kitchen in a certain way. You're designing. You're you're dealing with the various subs, and you're also dealing with the folks that buy the stoves and refrigerators and other things that further cut down on the space that's available in a kitchen and, and bathroom. Now, when you're dealing with a kitchen, the most important thing to notice in a kitchen is you're permitted to have a galley kitchen. The galley kitchen are those U-shaped kitchens that you see all the time. You know which ones I'm talking about? So, so there has to be 40 inches from counter to counter, unobstructed. So when you have a refrigerator that's that's too big, it's going to cut into that 40 inches. So the landlord or the builder must have a small refrigerator. Can you say, I like my bigger refrigerator, I don't mind having the, the, the space taken away, of course. But if you want a refrigerator within the two years, what we usually do is we have uh, a way in which to um, have an option to take that refrigerator out, replace it with a smaller unit. Now, the, remember what I was telling you, the 30 by 40 inch box is what you should remember. There has to be 35, 30 to 48 inch space parallel to and centered on the kitchen range and sink. So it really is so a person in a wheelchair could use the kitchen range or the kitchen sink. If you if there is not enough room, the person is not going to be able to use the sink, not going to be able to use the range. Next. So this is how it it, it works if it's designed correctly. Now, um, now go back one. Now, in this circumstance, it's not. So when the, the sink is in the corner, you see that the, that the person who uses a wheelchair won't even be able to get into the kitchen range or um, kitchen sink in this because they won't be able to get close to it or, or, or to it in any event. Next. Next. Now, a solution to that is to have knee space clearance by by the kitchen range of sink. So the 30 by 40 inches is is not parallel but perpendicular to it. So if a person could use the could use the the, the range by by getting their knees under it. That um, that's something that's allowable, but you still have to have the 30 by 40 inches knee space, and the same for the sink as well. And sometimes you see the knee space when you go into a public restroom, and you see that there's no the, that there's no under sink cabinet. It's it's so a person who uses a wheelchair can do a direct approach rather than a side approach, but you still need to think about whether or not there is 30 by 40 inches with that knee approach. Next, the next thing. Same thing with the bathroom. Now, when you have a, 
when you don't have the 30 by 40 and 30 by 48 inches um, parallel approach in the bathroom, what do you think the problems are with a person in a wheelchair that needs to use it? How can she brush her teeth and spit into the sink? You can't when, uh, when you don't have that, um, that 30 by 40 inches. 30 by 48 inches. So again, so what you see sometimes is this this area yeah. is 15 inches, and this is a must. If it's any closer than 15 inches, no matter what you do to this, it's going to be not compliant. A corner sink is not compliant. Um, if it is 30 by 48 inches, if it is 30 by 48 inches, so if there's 30 inches from here to there, what you need to do is you need to have a front approach so the person could go directly into it and there's 30 by 40 inches here. Um, if you have a front approach, the 30 by 48 inches, you have to have um, a removable sink cabinet. <clears throat> so a lot of buildings, a lot of developments have removable cabinets. So, and it's easy and simple still. And they're built that way. So, when when they build these things, they usually have almost a cantilever sink that, that's against the wall, and then they have a, a removable cabinet. That's what you'll see. But again, in order to use something like this, you have to have a front approach. You cannot have a parallel approach. Only to be a front approach. Sometimes, you're going to see the things and and you go to bathrooms and you see them often where where you have a long empty space on the same counter. That's because it is for a 30 by 48 inches um, side approach. Now the whole cabinet doesn't have to be 48 inches, but it has to be enough to have that side approach. So you're, for a parallel approach, your the central line of your sink. It's going to have to be on the 24 inch mark. You got it? I know it's, it's so esoteric thinking about it in numbers and design, but, but the basic premise is you have to be able to um, use the sink. And in order to use the sink, you either, it has to be on the 30 by 48 inch square. And it has to be central line though. Parallel approach on the 48 inches, straight approach on the 30 inches. Imagine explaining this to a jury, <laughs> and you wonder why I didn't get damages. <laughs> um, <laughs> next number, next page. So this is what I was saying, and this is for, this is in, in words rather than my try to explain it. 30 by 48. Floor, the laboratory must be parallel and centered on the basin. And um, for 48, for 36 inch wide vanity, the thing would have to be offset to obtain the required clear floor space. Again, all clear floor space means for purposes of. The Fair Housing Act is the 30 by 48 inch square. Now, the 30 by 48 inch square is another important factor when it comes to a bathroom. The 30 by 48 inches has to be outside this window, the door. Why do you think that's important? Because if the door was in the 30 by 48 inch square space, it would be able to close it. And that's a huge issue. It's a huge issue with my client who called. He uses a walker. He cannot leave his walker in the bathroom and use the bathroom without leaving the door open. So whenever he uses the bathroom, the bathroom. So that is not usable for a person who uses a wheelchair. How do you fix that? You change the swing of the door to swing out rather than in. Now, the issue with design and construction is something that um, you would think is, is very rare, 
but a lot of people don't even look for design and construction cases. Fair housing associations don't have the funding to do a lot of design and construction testing. It's a special test regimen that, um, that they need to do in order to find out if there are violations. They happen a lot when it comes to affordable housing because you try to get as many units in as small of a place as possible. So, so that's when you would see a lot of the violations when it comes to the size of the kitchen, which you see a lot. When they have a counter, even though it uh, looks like a huge kitchen, but they put a counter between the kitchen and the living room, and then there's not 40 inches there between counter to ca um, counter, cabinet to counter or counter to counter. Um, that's when you see these violations when it comes to these units. You see bathrooms that, that have um, really small laboratories where, where you have less than a foot between the side wall and the faucet. Those just are not usable. You see, you, you could look under the cabinets when you see a 30 inch um, laboratory and not a 48 inch laboratory and see that, um, that they're not removable. Usually you see two screws in the back where they just come right out. And if they're not removable, that's a violation. So you could look at all of these <clears> issues and say that, that there's something there. To the extent that you represent small business owners and contractors, it's something to say, are you aware of? You have to, it's not only the responsibility of the GC or the architect. If the architect says, install something pursuant to Florida code or ADA standards, how high do you want it? Mm -hmm. Now, the best website that I've seen with regards to any questions involving the Fair Housing Design and Construction Standards is called Fair Housing Accessibility First. That is a program of the Department of Housing and Urban Development where they do training and outreach to architects and contractors for fair housing accessibility. It also has the most recent cases and the most recent guidance. Fair housing. It's, yeah, if you want to type in fair housing accessibility first. Um, dot com, dot gov. Well, we'll put it up now. I think it's, I think it's dot com, but, but let's say fair housing accessibility first. But the first question that I always ask in an intake is, is this an old apartment or is it new? When was it built? When did you move in? Uh, so you can like deliberately break it if it's if it's if it's, if it's before old. if it's before ninety one, not even doesn't even do anything. If it's after ninety one, who's who built it? What's the standard? Do you have signs that know that? I mean, I, I, I feel like clients would know when they moved in, but not when the building was built. Well, well, sometimes they move in when there's a lease out. Like when they when they first <laughs> open up, and then and then they they, they know. And sometimes they don't. Where where also a person knows whether or not they, they live in a pretty a pretty new place or one that was built in the 1960s or 70s. I mean, that is that something that they would know? Um. To the extent that that they haven't been issued, there there's some places that still have units that haven't been issued full certificate of occupancy for all the units. Those ones, the of the statute hasn't even run yet. Um, do we have it here? Fair housing. What is it? Fair housing accessibility first. Yes, that's the web page. Fair housing first. That org. Fair housing first. Can you turn to the home page? Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah, and this is it's, and they have training sure. sessions and they focus on architects and contractors. And the sad part is a lot of architects and contractors don't know about this. Yeah, I can guarantee like ninety percent of my clients. Look, comment. They had, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, and they're and and they're the ones that um, that do the training for HUD, and and they presented it in Miami about three years ago as well. But this is this is where you need to go if there's any specific questions about any issue of one of the seven um, um, categories, even when it comes to what is. Um, what is accessible in a certain circumstance. There's also a whole book that's on here of, of the fair housing, on the fair housing guidelines. And that should be. I already know, I'm putting indemnification up to Wazoo for in every single contract because even with, I know that most of our clients that are GCs and whatnot, they probably just don't know about this. And this is like extremely dense, you know? And so half of them will just be like, well, they just, they know better. You know, they, the GCs or the architects know better. I'm just gonna do what they say. There's and no it's, indemnification. It's, no, no, no. It, you can't indemnify the yourself as it relates to the, to the GC? Correct. There's no indemnification under the Fair Housing Act. It's like any other discrimination case. Yeah. You're, um, you're liable for your own acts. You cannot sue for indemnification or contribution. If there is a contract case that you have there, you can sue under the contract, but you can't mm -hmm. sue under common law indemnity or contract. Okay, no, no, I'm talking about con like under contract. Now, that would this this would play out first, and then you kind of sue under the contract. But I'm not trying to get our clients to like avoid compliance with this, but you know, just seeing how this practically works out, like. But they, they would but probably the do it first. thing is, is if they comply with Florida code, mm -hmm. they're going to comply with us. Mm -hmm. the, the Fair Housing Guidelines are incorporated into the South Florida Building Code. Mm -hmm. um, there's some things in which they're not, which, which are still under dispute. Mm -hmm. For example, um, patios with hurricane shutters. It's the, the whole threshold thing with patios and hurricane shutters are still a disputed point. Um, there's, there's a disputed issue with regards to pool gates. What, how high should they be? And whether or not um, you're, you're dealing with uh, the safety code and the fair housing code. When you're dealing with the safety code, usually the safety code um, trumps the fair housing code. You need to find a better word. <laughs> um, but but there's a couple of areas in which it's amb ambiguous. But if you follow the South Florida Building Code, you're usually safe. Okay. So no. Right. Any other questions? Speaking of Trump, <laughs> has anybody ever gone after any Trump Tower for for you know, fair housing? Um, there there was there yes. Actually, and, it, and there was and there was <laughs> and there was an article about it about about how Trump did not want Braille in his elevators, and he didn't want Braille in his elevators because blind people aren't going to be able to live there anyway. Jeez, that guy so sucks. And there, and there was they want article, blind people walking around my building. Okay? <laughs> and there was an article about that about about how he didn't want to put Braille in his elevators. Now, now again, that would be under the second issue about common and public areas being accessible, including Braille and the elevators would be part of that. So yeah, somebody has got it um, against them before. But usually, the bigger the places are and fancier they are, the more likely they are to be built pursuant to mm -hmm. the guidelines, if not in ex exceeding the guidelines. You're not going to have a galley kitchen that's so tiny that you're not going to be able to go through mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it usually happens more in affordable housing. But again, I've been to places in which they um, developers decide that they like to put steps everywhere. If they put steps everywhere, usable doors also includes closet doors. So, so to the extent that they have little tiny closet doors that you can't reach into, that that you need to be that aren't wide enough, those doors have to be wide enough as well. So any usable doors have to be wide enough. I was going to ask um, 
I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. Hold on. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just had it in my Any other questions? Yep. Going back to that when student case. So obviously some of the residents that would be able to have that student go to another unit where it's acceptable. And let's say that's not the case and all the um, units there are old go so after nineteen ninety. And that applies for the residents to essentially go after everyone that was involved in the design and construction and have them change that. Now, those are a couple of good questions. If the, the issues you have in a university like UM is homes were built for the past 30 years. Yes. So, so to the extent that it is a, a school, one university and one housing program, and one 504 office that you would have to look at all of them in, um, together and say, if this place isn't accessible, what dorm can you be in that is accessible? Now, if let's say he's in a certain dorm, a, a language dorm, and he wants to be in a language dorm, or he wants to be in the science dorm, and that was built in, in 1965, what they would have to do is not under the Fair Housing Act, but under Section 504, they would have to essentially rebuild it to the extent that um, that is useful to him. Now, for now, for my client, I use as a walker. Not that part, but if you're dealing with somebody who's a, a quadriplegic. And you may have to bust down walls or bust down doors or widen doors or widen bathrooms or put in or put in um, showers. So under 504, you would need to do that because you're you're looking at the overall financial resources, you're looking at undue burden, and it's hard to have an undue burden for the University of Miami or for a state school. So so your burden is 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 huge in order to make that specific program or service accessible for that person. So if you wouldn't look under the design and construction standards. Under the design and construction standards, let's say he was placed in the new in the new graduate dorms on, on Red Road and those were built. They don't have the option to say, I'm gonna put you in a different they have to make those accessible. So you can sue them under the design and construction standards for, for a newly built facility. So when you look at a, a place, you look to say, what law applies? Is it 504? Is it the Fair Housing Act? What provision of the Fair Housing Act, existing construction or new construction? Or is it the ADA? Usually the ADA and the Fair Housing Act are, you know, two sides of the same coin. But when you're dealing with a public accommodation that's also housing, then you may be dealing with the mixture of them both. So, so you may be having larger facilities, um, larger bedrooms, larger bathrooms, more usable facilities. But under 504, it's tailored to that specific person. You said the remedy is always they have to cons they have to fix the building and all the units. Remedies, yes. They have to fix they have to fix the, the issue. You get injunctive relief. They have to fix what's wrong. You have monetary is, relief. You have compensatory damages. So is settlement not an option? Settlement's always an option. But they still have to do those. You can't just you can for whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But but if you have a good settlement, mm -hmm. you would want them to fix the problem. Or to have some other fix, or to have a retrofit button, or to um, <clears throat> like one of the things that that we've done for a condominium association when they had ramps going into every single patio, you must have a supply of 20 ramps, and that if somebody wants one, you have to put one in. Or if you have an existing person there and they want the bathroom fixed, 
in order to have uh, a um, room underneath the, the six upon request, they, um, they need to do it. So you would have a listing to say, if you need this done forevermore, you have to do it. The issue in a design and construction case is you're not only doing it for the person who currently lives there, but for anybody who wants to live there in the future. Great. So I have a question. And I'm sorry to interrupt you in my accent, but it's only a percentage of the units that have to be created. It doesn't have to be all the units. All the units. Well, I'm thinking if unless all, unless they're not connected by an elevator. Well, the reason why I ask that is because if all the units are that way, then I'm thinking that I see one of the um units that you showed where a person who's in a wheelchair is easy to arrange, that's accessible. That's not usable because it's too low. You feel what I'm saying? So why would somebody build all their units that way? Because they have to. And with all the new construction, like all the new construction is that way. Um, and you could, um, you could alter it once you get in there and you could do what you want. <laughs> But but once but if you purchase a place, it has to be built to the to the standards. Now the standards don't say that you have to have a certain height countertop. The how the, uh, the standards say you have to have usable bathrooms and kitchens. So you have to have 40 inches from counter to counter. You have to have you have to be have it centered by 30 by 48 inches on the range or or on the sink. But the height of it is not mandated. The height is the height's not mandated, but it has to be usable. So 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 the perfect usability for a person in a wheelchair may be 34 inches, but you don't have to have it at 34 inches. You could have it at 40 inches. I, I guess I'm just not walking to any reconstruction ever <laughs> and seeing any of that. Like I've seen it in Units that have been made compliant or adapted for that purpose. But there's, I mean, if you're going shopping for a condo or something like that, you're never going to walk into a unit that looks that way. And if you don't, they can be sued. Got it. So I mean, it's it it just, it's it, it, every unit that was built after 1991 that's on an accessible route, that's in an elevator building, or or in a building that's connected by, you know, how sometimes you have garages that go up six flights in a building. So any time it's just, you have to have access to the unit, you have to have a way in and throughout the unit, you have to have usable kitchens and bathrooms. There's a issue which I'm, there's a type A bathroom and a type B bathroom if you have a powder room in the front, there's a different construction for that. But but for the most part, you have to have usable bathrooms, usable kitchens, doors that, that are usable, and, and doors you can get into and out. But, the kitchen design is is something that is a problem that you see in many units, but the issue is that if a person wants to change it, once they buy it, they can do what they want with with their own unit. But it must be initially built accessible. So it could be adaptable. And if all the You've seen don't look like that. That's a problem. The accessible, like you know, the entryways of all those things. What I'm really talking about is like, for instance, for me. So at the very back of the box, I can imagine that. Like, okay, what I've seen, but like I've never seen a range that low. No, it doesn't. It doesn't right. have a it so, doesn't have a height of the range right. because so, you're you're not going to have a range that 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 is at at 42 inches. That's that's too high for any person. Right. And a stove usually is by design. About about 36 inches, and then you have the counter that's on top of it. So so to the extent that it's a normal range, it's fine. The issue you have to watch is for a person to get around. Any questions on the phone? Yes, we have a few questions here in Broward. Great, Broward. Uh, you guys can hear us. Yes. Oh, wonderful. So the first question that we had pertains to whether or not these design and construction standards um, are applicable to post-1991 assisted living facilities and nursing homes, particularly where um, there, there are units that don't necessarily have kitchens. Um, 
So that was a kind of our, our question here, one of our questions here. Uh, a nursing home would be, you would look at the ADA sta standards for a nursing home for the okay. most part. Okay. Um, unless, unless they are individual living units like, like one of these assisted living units like the Hyatt assisted living where, where it's an apartment. <clears throat> Um, to the extent that it's more of uh, a nursing home type type issue where you have a room and and a bathroom, you would look more to the ADA sta standards. Okay. Um, and I think you may have answered our question, another question that we had in our presentation, but um, a very common thing that we keep seeing are people trying to construct um, micro units and we're presuming that those would need to comply to the design and construction standards that you specified today. Without a doubt. Okay. Without a doubt. And that and that's going to be a huge um, that's going to be a huge issue. I think you could have the micro units in a in a hotel environment, um, and that you would have to have a certain amount of of units that are accessible. But to the extent that you have a micro unit. In in a, an apartment type environment, um, and they're more than four units, they would have to comply with the act. Okay. Um, another question we have is actually um, actually we have two more questions, and they're carryovers from your presentation last week. Oh, that was much more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so one was just um, in terms of protected classes under the Fair Housing Act. You mentioned that certain counties throughout Florida have enacted ordinances regarding protecting or non-discrimination on the basis of source of income. And we were curious as to whether you've handled that type of source of income litigation. Oh yeah, um, I, I, I have without a doubt. I, okay. I actually had um, one involving, uh, uh, it was, it was actually funny. It was involving a blind woman who um, was complaining because she wasn't getting her her accommodation. And then they said, you know what? We don't accept uh, Miami vouchers anymore. We only accept Hialeah vouchers or, or, or something to that extent. I was like, okay, so you're discriminating against her because she had a disability and then you're retaliating against her based upon source of income. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, and then our final question. I'm sorry that we have so many questions. We just wanted to, I just no, want to make please. sure. Okay. I have all um, the time in the world. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. I think our final question that we have here, um, I think you had mentioned something during last week's presentations regarding when the landlords are responsible for making the modifications. And we wanted to know whether that's only applicable for public housing or housing otherwise funded by HUD or whether it applies to private landlords as well? It only applies to landlords that receive federal financial assistance under 504. Okay. So it would apply to folks <clears throat> that get HUD funding. Um, it applies to folks that get USDA funding. It applies to um, colleges, universities, dorms, things like that. It applies to medical facilities. For example, if somebody gets Medicaid or Medicare funding. So any federal financial assistance. Okay, thank you so much. You've answered our questions. Great. Does anybody have any questions from, from last week? Dogs, service animals, personal support animals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.